Hello, good evening to everybody here and welcome to the uh, British Nigeria Law Forum BNLF webinar that today looks at international justice and Africa. Um, we've got an interesting uh, amount of people attending here today, uh, some from the legal, diplomatic, the academic world and others. And the purpose for today really is to give you an insight into matters that concern international justice as it relates to the African continent. So we're looking at areas such as international criminal justice and investor state dispute settlement. I am your host this evening and my name is Tok Sasein. I'm an international law consultant at the International Nuremberg Principles Academy and I'm also the co-head of the British Nigeria Law Forum Junior Lawyers Division. So for those of you who don't know much about the BNLF, well, it is a bilateral organization which serves as a communication forum between British and Nigerian lawyers for their mutual benefit and also the promotion of legal ideals. So BNLF is recognized by the Law Society, the SRA, the Bar Standards Board and the Nigerian Bar Association. BNLF also has a number of divisions, including the Junior Lawyers Division, JLD, uh, a Business Law Division, Family Law Division, and Immigration Law Division. Now, in terms of housekeeping for today, uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded, and we will make it available on the BNLF website, should you wish to watch it again. Please also feel free to ask questions during the webinar using the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen. And I shall raise your questions with the panelist during the Q&A session, which follows the panel discussion. There is also a poll for you at the bottom of the screen for you to answer throughout the webinar. So please feel free to um, answer the poll. In fact, we encourage you to do so. So I'm very happy and very excited because we have a very accomplished panel of speakers before you today. Now, how it's going to run is this. They'll each speak for 15 minutes, which is going to be followed by a panel discussion and Q&A session for 45 minutes. And our discussion today will cover the following areas. Uh, firstly, we have the ICC's relationship with Africa. International Criminal Court. Then we're going to consider the domestic justice for core international crimes. Also, we're going to look at or discuss or rather the work of the special um, residual special court for Sierra Leone and also reforming the investor state dispute settlement system in Africa, just so that it's not too much of a focus on international criminal justice. Now, um, let me introduce to you our speakers for today. In terms of our first speaker, our first speaker is Dr. Dahiro O. Santana. He replaces, or rather he steps in for his colleague Adeshola Adeboyejo, who uh, couldn't make it today. Now he is an international corporation advisor in the office of the prosecutor. Previously, Dr. Santana worked as associate legal officer for the ICC detention section. 2007 to 2015. During this period, he temporarily acted as registry legal coordinator in 2010, and before that, he was the ICC protocol officer from 2005 to 2007. From 2009 to 2013, Dr. Santana was the ICC Staff Union Council first vice president, and since 2016, he has been a part-time guest lecturer in the Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms course at the University of Toulouse in France. He often speaks and trains in matters relating to strengthening the judicial capacities of state parties in the ICC, uh, state parties to the ICC, I should say, as well as providing training on international criminal justice to media practitioners, law enforcement officers, lawyers, military officers, and academia in the training programs of the African Center of International Criminal Justice at the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration since 2017. Dr. Santana is a holder of a PhD in international law, the highest honor. 
and also a diploma of advanced studies public law, both from the University of Le Manche in France. Our next speaker is Angela Mudakuti. Angela Mudakuti is a Zimbabwean human rights lawyer specializing in international criminal law. Angela is the Associate Advocacy Officer at the Open Society Justice Initiative and was previously an international justice consultant for Human Rights Watch and the senior international criminal justice lawyer at the YMO Foundation. At YMO, she focused on advocacy and capacity building for African prosecutors and investigators to further enhance domestic capacity to investigate and prosecute transnational organized, organized crime and core international crimes. Previously, Angela was the international criminal justice lawyer at the Southern Africa Litigation Center, the SALC, where she worked on precedent set in cases on, on crimes against humanity and universal jurisdiction before the South African Constitutional Court and was deeply involved in advocacy and strategic litigation, including seeking the arrest of former President Bashir of Sudan during his visit to South Africa. And prior to joining SALC, Angela worked in the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, ICC, and under the supervision of Professor uh, Sheriff Bassioni at the International Institute for Criminal Justice and Human Rights in Syracuse, Italy. And prior to that, Angela was in private practice in Zimbabwe, working on civil and criminal matters. Angela has an LLM in International Criminal Law and Transitional Justice and an undergraduate law degree. She has written and published on international criminal law issues in books, journals, and newspapers. Our next speaker is Mohamed A. Bangura. Mohamed A. Bangura is from Sierra Leone. He is a prosecution legal advisor and evidence officer at the Residual Special Court for Sierra Leone, the RSCSL in The Hague. He was a trial attorney in the office of the prosecutor Special Court for Sierra Leone from 2002 to 2013, and he participated in SESL's four major trials. Last but not the least is Mamadou Hebi. Dr. Mamadou Hebi is a legal officer, special assistant to the president of the International Court of Justice, Judge Abdelkawi A. Yusuf. Before joining the court, Dr. Hebi was from 2016 to 2018, Assistant Professor of International Law at the Grotius Center of International, sorry, for International Legal Studies at Leiden University. From 2013 to 2016, he acted as lecturer at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva in the Master in International Dispute Settlement Program. He holds a PhD, summa cum laude, avec les félicitations des jurés in 2012, and also a Diploma in Advanced Studies Specialization in International Law 2006 from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies. Dr. Mah Dr. Mamadou Hebi also graduated from Harvard Law School, the LLM class of 2012, and the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights in 2005, and is a recipient of the Diplomas of the Hague Academy of International Law in 2010, and the Inst International Institute of Human Rights 2009. And his PhD thesis on agreements concluded between colonial powers and local political entities as a means of acquiring territorial sovereignty was awarded in 2016, the Paul Guggenheim Prize in International Law. In terms of other things he's done, well, he's acted as advisor to the Argentine Republic in the ARA Libertad case, before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And his areas of interest include general international law, international dispute settlement mechanisms, territorial and maritime boundary disputes, international humanitarian law and human rights, international economic law, and interestingly enough, the history of international law. So as you can see, we have a fine panel before you today, and I welcome you all on behalf of the British Nigeria Law Forum. On that note, I am very pleased to invite our first speaker, Dr. Daihiru Santana, 
to talk to us now about the ICC's relationship with Africa. Over to you, Dahiru. Um, good morning, uh, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, um, my uh, fellow speaker of the high table, even though we are doing this remotely. Um, uh, thank you, uh, thanks for inviting the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC uh, to this um, uh, webinar, and I am honored to be uh, among the speakers of today. Uh, indeed, my presentation uh, focuses on the relationship, to, uh, relationship between the ICC and Africa and in particular some of the controversy many of you have heard. But I think uh, as a preliminary observation, it's worth highlighting that those controversy are now uh, topics of the past uh, because a lot of progress has been made since then to actually improve the relationship we have with Africa. Um, I, I do have a PowerPoint presentation actually, um, but I don't know whether it's possible for, for Tux to help me uh, display it. If you click oh, on the oh, bottom oh. of the screen, you'll see share screen, and you should be able to share your presentation okay. with us. See. Share this one. Okay, I believe everybody can see it now. So, Yes, indeed. So, uh, and I think that um, uh, to, to be able to understand uh, those controversy, it's worth highlighting um, how a case or a situation is grow before the ICC. Um, as you may know, ICC is a treaty-based organization uh, funded by the Rome Statute. And the Rome Statute uh, actually uh, uh, has uh, 123 state parties, 33 of uh, which are African states. And I must say, this is the biggest regional uh, group before the ICC. And uh, as the practice, uh, for ICC to have jurisdiction or to intervene in a particular state, uh, there are some conditions under the Rome Statute which you would have in any convention or any treaty. And uh, the way uh, uh, investigations are triggered starts first with referral by states. As you can see, uh, you have had in the context of Africa, uh, states that have requested uh, ICC to intervene to investigate. This is the case of uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, the Central African Republic, and Mali. And to some extent, Cote d'Ivoire, even though Cote d'Ivoire used a means that is completely different. Uh, it wasn't a state party, but it's accepted uh, uh, the jurisdiction of the ICC through a declaration. The other way for uh, a situation to be brought is uh, through the United Nations Security Council. And in particular, uh, the United Security Council would refer a situation to the ICC acting under uh, the United Nations uh, Charter, in particular, Chapter 7. That was the case for the Darfur and the Libya situation. The other possibility to bring actually a situation is for the ICC prosecutor, uh, him or herself, to actually initiate uh, through his or her own power an investigation. And we have done so in the Kenya and the Burundi uh, situation. Now, obviously, the fact that uh, uh, a state or the United Nations refer a situation to the ICC doesn't mean that automatically the investigation uh, starts. Uh, we at the Office of the Prosecutor have to satisfy ourselves that uh, the requisite legal and factual criteria under the Rome Statute are met for us to determine that there is a reasonable basis to open an investigation. And we do that in the context of what we call preliminary examination. And the preliminary examination uh, is a step to assess on the basis of information that the office has received, that information can come from states, international organization, uh, civil society organization, private citizens, groups of victims. We have to assess then whether the information uh, or communication that we have received uh, pass the test uh, to be able to see that we have met the threshold uh, after which we can open an investigation. The first thing we have to do is to obviously uh, see whether we have jurisdiction over uh, uh, the, the situation. And that jurisdiction requires to see what kind of crimes, is, uh, what, what are the crimes committed? Is it 
genocide? Is it crimes against humanity? Is it a war crime? Is it crime of aggression? Once we have satisfied that requirement, we have to check when it happens, which is more the temporal jurisdiction. Did it happen from the 1st July 2002? 1st July 2002 is when the Rome Treaty entered into force. And therefore, when a situation is brought to the ICC, we have to satisfy ourselves that that situation falls within that temporal scope. And then, uh, were the crime committed on the territory of a state party? That is also something we have to look at. And also, uh, uh, simultaneously see whether there is uh, uh, a, 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 there may be situations where crimes are committed on the territory of a non-state party, but if those crimes are attributed to someone who actually is a citizen of state party, then ICC can still uh, 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 investigate. That is the first step, the jurisdiction. The next step is what we call admissibility. Admissibility has two components. One is complementarity and the other one is the gravity of the crimes. Obviously, ICC uh, remains a court of last resort. And the principle of complementarity uh, uh, states that the primary responsibility is for an individual state to actually investigate and prosecute crimes that have occurred on its territory or that were committed by its own citizens. So what we do at the ICC is to assess that admissibility to see whether indeed at the national level, there have been procedures uh, or initiatives taken by the authorities to investigate and prosecute those crimes. And when doing that, that assessment, the Office of the Prosecutor has to determine whether uh, in the events nothing is done, whether the uh, state is unable to investigate or, and prosecute, or whether the state is unwilling to do, to do that. So we have to satisfy that requirement as well. And the next step is the gravity of the crimes. The gravity of the crimes to have to meet the necessary threshold to be uh, brought before the ICC. We cannot go, for example, for a killing of one, two citizens when it doesn't happen in a particular context. So we have to look at the nature of the crimes, the scales, and the impacts, in, in, including whether the, there is a, a, a quite important number of victims, those are elements that the ICC has to, to uh, the Office of the Prosecutor has to assess. And the last aspect is the interest of justice. So the ICC has to, and particularly the Office of the Prosecutor has to determine whether by not investigating or prosecuting, we're serving the interest of justice. And usually it will be to look into what is the interest of the victims. Once that is done, and there is a determination that there's a reasonable basis to proceed further, then uh, the ICC would move on with the investigation. At the preliminary examination stage, uh, as you can see, we currently have nine preliminary examinations which are, which are ongoing, and two are actually happening in, uh, in uh, Africa. These are Gu Guinea and Nigeria. The rest, the remainder, are actually uh, relating to other continents, Asia, Latin America, and Europe. And when we come to the cases that are brought before the ICC, over the 13 situations that are open, 10 are occurring on the continent. And among those 10, as I've already uh, uh, mentioned before, uh, actually five to six were referred by the African state themselves to the ICC, except for two by the United Nations Security Council and one by the ICC prosecutor. And uh, the three others, as you can see, are the, the one related to the Rohingya, uh, Georgia, and Afghanistan. Uh, now, let me move to the issue of the controversy that we've had uh, with the ICC. Obviously, many of you have heard that ICC uh, had a bias or at least bias vis-a-vis -vis Africa. It's a politicized organization. Uh, many have said that it was a Western court or that uh, ICC has been carrying uh, an imperialist agenda. And this started actually back in 2005, when the United Nations uh, Security Council referred the situation of the Darfur Sudan to the ICC. And obviously, uh, for many African leaders and the African Union, the issue was uh, that ICC uh, couldn't investigate for many reasons. Uh, and those reasons were that 
there is a need to ensure reconciliation. Uh, the uh, Sudanese authorities can investigate and prosecute themselves. And uh, in that context, AU has come up with a number of declarations, a number of uh, uh, resolutions where actually they uh, did indicate that there shouldn't be any cooperation by African state with the ICC. The situation got exacerbated uh, after the Kenyan uh, uh, referral, actually when the former prosecutor of the ICC decided to open an investigation in Kenya following the electoral violence in 2006-2007. And obviously, as you can see, uh, in the Darfur situations, um, the investigation were, uh, and the warrant of arrest that were issued related to the sitting president Omar Bashir, Omar Bashir back then. Uh, in the uh, context of the Kenya, it was about both the current president Uhuru Kenyatta and the vice president uh, William uh, Ruto. And uh, it uh, went to the point that the former chairperson of the AU Commission, Mr. Jean Ping from Gabon, did accuse ICC from harassing Africa and even said that it seems that Africa has become a new laboratory to test the new international law. This gives you uh, a kind of uh, idea of how the tension between ICC and Africa was. In uh, Libya back in 2009, uh, the AU called uh, for ICC to uh, suspend all its procedures uh, in a particular case of uh, Darfur. And they also tried to seize the United Nations Security Council to use its power by the virtue of Article 6 of the Rome, uh, 16 of the Rome Statute to suspend the investigation. Uh, obviously, the United Nations Security Council didn't respond. In the context of ICC, uh, um, by the time uh, this call came, we have already uh, found that we, uh, all the legal criteria were satisfied and the process was going. And then uh, it reaches the point where uh, within the AU, there are many voices calling for a mass withdrawal uh, from ICC uh, um, state parties or ICC African state parties. And indeed, uh, the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they consider that uh, uh, the investigation and preliminary examination of the ICC uh, constitute a threat to peace and security, that uh, they were against the uh, reconciliation effort, but most importantly, that it was in violation of uh, the immunity granted to head of state, in particular sitting head of states. And uh, the call for, the, for uh, uh, many of the states to not cooperate with the ICC. It is actually in this context that uh, the AU came up with this Malabo protocol, which was a protocol on the amendment to the protocol of the African, uh, yet to be African uh, uh, Court of Justice uh, uh, on Human Rights, uh, and in which they extend uh, the jurisdiction on, uh, over international crime and transnational crimes. I think uh, during the Q&A session, we can have uh, we will hopefully have an opportunity to discuss about this Malabo protocol. And it is again in this context that when uh, the prosecutor, the current prosecutor decided to open an investigation in Burundi following uh, the uh, crimes committed, uh, allegedly committed between 2005, 2015 and 2017, that Burundi withdrew from uh, the ICC uh, Rome statute. Well, I must say that uh, um, Against all the criticism, uh, it's important also to say that we have made progress. We have tried to reach out to the African Union and to African states. And, and uh, in, in that sense, uh, as you've seen from 10 situations, we have uh, on the continent, since were referred by the uh, African state themselves, uh, you have uh, uh, ICC being, uh, conducting a preliminary examination and we cooperate with those states to assist to them whenever uh, there is a need for that. Uh, on, on the number of requests for cooperation that we send to Africa, I can tell you that 80% of them are executed. And uh, it is worth highlighting that when AU called for African uh, state to withdraw from the ICC, many uh, countries actually voiced their opposition to that saying, it is an individual and sovereign decision to ratify the Rome Statute, and therefore AU can't compel African uh, state to withdraw from the ICC. And uh, in that sense, uh, the reality of the cooperation is that we do have agreement, we do have memorandum of understanding with many African countries. Uh, we have access to the territory. Uh, we do con collect evidence. We interview even state officials. 
we have access to private citizens and, and other, other uh, witnesses to collect the evidence that we need. Uh, we even go beyond that because some African states approach the, the ICC to request for the ICC to help them build their own uh, national capacities, their judicial capacities, and we have been doing uh, that in, in many of the African countries. Obviously, when we're talking about uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, African Union, and then uh, I must say that African Union is not African states. It's an organization, it's a, it's a continental body, obviously, but within that continental body, you do have uh, states with the individual, uh, uh, I would say, interests or concerns. And, and most fundamentally, and, and I would probably stop here, when we discuss the relationship between uh, Africa and, and ICC, uh, you rarely hear um, the leaders talk about the fate of the victims. Those uh, many millions of victims who were eventually raped, displaced, uh, uh, bodily injured, and, and uh, some were even children abducted at a young age to participate in the facilities, uh, we rarely talk about the victims. And I think that it's very important to uh, put the, the victims at the heart of the discussion when we're talking about the relationship between AU and Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dahiru, for a very insightful talk. And no doubt that the attendees will have questions. Uh, I remind you that you can use the Q&A tool to ask questions, which I'll post to the speakers in due course. And also there's a poll um, on the bottom of the screen. So if you agree, if you're persuaded by what Dahiru has said, then, then vote in favor of what he said. Uh, otherwise, you know what to do. Um, I'm now very pleased to introduce, uh, well, to ask our second speaker, Angela Mudukuti, to talk to us now about domestic justice for core international crimes. So, Angela, up to, uh, up to you now. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you all this evening, and very warm greetings to you all, wherever you're joining. Um, I will begin by saying that I'll be speaking in my personal capacity, not on behalf of any organization. So with that said, I've been working in international criminal justice for over 10 years now, and I cannot begin to stress the importance of appreciating the international criminal justice system as a whole. And what I mean by this is that we need to realize that justice needs to happen at the domestic level, at the regional level, and at the international level. There is no competition. These entities, these bodies can function in a complementary manner. My fellow panelists has already spoken about the ICC and its relationship with Africa. So I'm not gonna go into that, but what I'm going to talk about is domestic justice and the domestic justice attempts within the continent. I will highlight the successes, the challenges and the way forward. So why domestic justice? The reasons are simple and quite compelling in my opinion. When it functions in an impartial and just way, it's the best in the sense that it is closer in geographical proximity to the survivors, to the victims, and to the affected communities. And when it is done properly, it facilitates the continuous building of domestic capacity, specifically with regard to investigators, prosecutors, judges, and other judicial officials. It's also just a fundamental part of developing the rule of law in any nation. And as we all know, there is no African criminal court with jurisdiction over these crimes. And the ICC was not designed to bear the burden of dispensing justice everywhere. It was designed as a court of last resort. And that means that domestic justice systems must pull their proverbial weight. So the first case I'll give an example of domestic justice is a case I worked on during my time at the Southern Africa Litigation Center, which is a Johannesburg based NGO focused on strategic litigation. This case is colloquially known as the Zimbabwe torture case, and it's about torture committed as a crime against humanity in Zimbabwe, by Zimbabweans, against Zimbabweans, but to be investigated and prosecuted in South Africa. So as a Zimbabwean myself, no doubt you can see the significance of this case for me, because Zimbabwe at that time, and I'm talking about 2008 when there was a great deal of political instability, fell through what I call the justice cracks. It was, not, it was not and is not still to this day an ICC signatory. It is not going to be referred to the ICC because of a very close relationship to one of the members on the Security Council. And at that time, domestic justice for crimes perpetrated by people operating on behalf of the state was almost impossible. 
And so what we had is we had a situation where there was a raid conducted on the opposition party headquarters and people who were suspected to be members of the opposition party and people who were actually members of the opposition party were rounded up and tortured en masse. Many of those victims fled to South Africa, neighboring country. And we were able to gather witness testimony and corroborating evidence and compile a dossier of evidence that we presented to the National Prosecuting Authority in South Africa. And we said to them that in terms of South African domestic legislation, in particular, the South African ICC Act, which domesticates the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, but also provides for universal jurisdiction, in terms of this legislation, the National Prosecuting Authority has a duty to investigate and then decide if prosecution is warranted. Now this legislation, I'll summarize it in short, it just says that if you have been suspected to have committed genocide, war crimes or crimes against humanity, and you are found in the Republic of South Africa after the commission of that crime, you are liable for investigation and prosecution, simply put. And so of course the authorities said no, they would not investigate this case. And what we then had to do was take that refusal to investigate on judicial review. And we were successful before the High Court, the Supreme Court of Appeal, and the Constitutional Court, which is the highest court in South Africa. And all three courts ruled that South Africa has a duty to investigate these crimes. Now, this case is a success because you have here the key ingredients for domestic justice. You have active civil society. You have civil society that have space to operate. Many civil society organizations are repressed within their own situation and within their own countries. You also had adequate legislation, in particular, the ICC Act that I mentioned, domestic lawyers who are well versed in international criminal law, impartial courts who are prepared to rule against their own governments, and then of course, strategic partnerships, with organizations working on a similar cause. And these ingredients put together provides an opportunity for domestic justice. And then of course, universal jurisdiction, which is a very creative and useful way to bring justice to situations that seem hopeless. And there's another very good example on the continent, which is the case of Hissène Habré, the Ch former Chadian dictator who was prosecuted in Senegal. Now his case of course took place after the stars aligned and there was a very unique constellation of events and much effort from activists and survivors. And eventually 25 years after the, the time he committed his crimes, he was found guilty. And I remember being in court when the verdict was read and witnessing the reaction from the survivors and their legal counsel. And it was just a reminder of what you can do when you have universal jurisdiction, even though it was years after he'd committed those crimes, but it was of great significance to the people, to the victims, and also to the continent as a whole, because now we have that jurisprudence that we can lean on in the future. So I want to go back to South Africa briefly to give you another example. And this is the case uh, where we attempted to arrest former president of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir. Al-Bashir is wanted for genocide war and crimes against humanity by the ICC. And Ever since he was indicted in 2009 and 2010, respectively, he has evaded justice. And the reason for this is simple. The ICC relies on states parties to execute arrest warrants. If someone is in your territory who's wanted by the ICC, there's a duty to arrest them. And many states have failed. Chad, Malawi, Kenya, just to name but a few, and of course, South Africa. And the reason for this is mostly political. But in our case, when we found out that South Africa would be hosting the African Union Summit in 2015, we knew that this would be an opportunity to seek his arrest for subsequent transfer to The Hague. And of course, in the eyes of the law, he's innocent until proven guilty, but the point is he needs to answer for his crimes and stand trial. And so in the interest of upholding the rule of law and facilitating justice, we approached the courts on an emergency basis when, he found out, when we found out he had landed in South Africa. Now, South Africa not only had an international duty as a signatory to the Rome Statute, but in terms of its own domestic legislation, again, the ICC Act that I've mentioned, there was a duty as well. And so the courts ruled in our favor and ordered his arrest. Unfortunately, he escaped before the arrest warrants could be executed, but you can imagine the embarrassment of a head of state having to escape like a thief in the night. In addition to setting a precedent that has been very useful when you see how arrest warrants should be effected in states parties. It was also an impactful case, even though we did not succeed, we didn't get him, but it was impactful in the sense that the victims were touched by this. I remember receiving emails and messages from all over the world, including victims from Darfur to say, thank you for trying. So even though we were unsuccessful, it still had an impact. 
And again, I raise this case because it speaks to something I mentioned in the beginning, which is understanding international justice as a whole and understanding that the ICC relies on states parties and understanding that states parties have a duty and understanding that states parties need the right legislation and those key ingredients that I mentioned to make sure that they can execute, can conduct justice as well. But this also leads me to the challenges. And the first one, politics, 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 political considerations, corrupt leaders who have what I call a justice allergy, people who refuse to be held accountable. This is one of the primary inhibitors to domestic justice. We saw that in the Bashir case, even in the Zimbabwe torture case I mentioned earlier, where many of the South African authorities said, well, we don't want to investigate this because this will affect our political relationship with our neighbor Zimbabwe. Another problem, lack of capacity. So with one of the former NGOs I worked for, we were heavily engaged in training investigators and prosecutors in Nigeria, Kenya, Tanzania, just to name a few. And it was so empowering to see what they were capable of with the right support, but also very distressing to see what happens when they don't have the right support. And this support also includes inadequate legislation, which is another challenge. When you don't have the right legal foundation, it is very difficult to do the job that you've been asked to do as an investigator or as a prosecutor. And in some instances, the solution might be domesticating the Rome Statute, but in other cases, you can amend your penal code, you can adjust your criminal legislation to make sure it covers the gaps and make sure that there is provision made for the prosecution and investigation of genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Again, in Nigeria, which is a situation that's already been mentioned, I worked with prosecutors there and they have been tasked with investigating and prosecuting Boko Haram suspects. And they're also under preliminary examination by the ICC, as was earlier explained. And so there is a significant amount of pressure on the prosecutors and investigators. And many of them said to me, it would be so much easier if we had a domesticated version of the Rome Statute to work with, because they don't. They're a signatory state, but there's no domestication. And they have other tools that they're using and other pieces of legislation that they're being innovative with. But in many cases, it would facilitate their work if they had domesticated the Rome Statute. Another challenge I'll focus on is, or just mention briefly rather, is a lack of resources. And this is a challenge in many of our African countries. I'll pick Uganda, for example, which established the International Crimes Division, which is a specially mandated, specially mandated division that's designed to tackle international crimes, including terrorism, genocide, etc. And they have the case of Thomas Coelho, who is a member of the Lord's Resistance Army, and it is their first war crimes case. And his case began in 2011 and remains unresolved today. And there have been many challenges, but resources has been one of them. A lack of resources is slowing down the process. But I want to end on a constructive note and reassure you that none of these challenges are insurmountable. The first thing we need to do is build domestic capacity. We need to build our investigators, our prosecutors, and equip them to do the job that they need to do. We also need to talk and be proactive about law reform, improving legislation to provide law enforcement, investigators and prosecutors with a basis upon which they can work. We need to direct resources to the courts and to the justice system as a whole. And finally, we need to remain engaged and support the establishment of a regional court insofar as it is credible and not promoting impunity. And most importantly, remain engaged with the international justice mechanisms that exist. This means supporting and being critical when necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Angela. That was very, very, very insightful. And uh, we look forward to you being quizzed in due course. <laughs> so um, let me now invite our third speaker, uh, Mohammed A. Bangura, to talk about the work of the Residual Special Court for Sierra Leone. Mohammed, up to you here. Good evening, uh, Chair. Good evening, uh, fellow participants and uh, our, uh, our viewers. Thank you very much for uh, inviting uh, the residual special. Uh, based in the Hague, temporarily resident uh, of, of in the Hague. And we have uh, free time. And we have been operating as a, now tonight. The, 
questions would be focused on the uh, predecessor institution. Special report came before the residual court. What is that achieved? And if for our and, uh, justice uh, systems. It is important to reflect on the special court before we can even talk about uh, special court is 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 we gave but special court the residual court because both institutions cannot be uh, you know, uh, special court for Sierra Leone was established in 2000 lasted about 11 years and after that uh, conflict the government of Sierra Leone requested uh, the assistance of the UN uh, for some form of justice mechanism to be set up to bring accountability for the crimes and uh, for the first time we had a new model of justice of, of, of international uh, justice being introduced which was uh, uh, a court a hybrid court uh, one whereby there was an agreement between the government of Sierra Leone and the UN uh, in its establishment uh, before that, of course, we all know that there had been the ICTY and the ICTR, and these were uh, established very directly from the uh, uh, under UN Chapter 7 mandate. The uh, creation of the Special Court gave an opportunity for uh, Sierra Leone, but not just Sierra Leone, Africa, to have a stake in international criminal justice in the sense that um, uh, the model which was created gave uh, uh, us some ownership in the court in the in the process in the sense that we had a court which had which had uh judges drawn from both uh, appointed by both the un and the government of sierra leone uh, uh staff members basically especially within the office of the prosecutor uh being both international uh, staff and and local sierra leoneans and, and a, a host, a wide host of other areas where we had uh, many Sierra Leoneans participating in the work of the court. Now, to a large extent, it gave Sierra Leoneans a sense of ownership, a sense of being part of that process. Uh, but let's move forward. This court, uh, as I said, you know, there was conflict in, for 11 years, and, uh, uh, and at the end of that process, we had the court. Uh, now, the court had a mandate which was to prosecute those who bear the greatest responsibility for all those crimes that were committed. Well, in 11 years, it was very difficult to, uh, you know, implement a mandate which was so limited. Uh, and in the end, anyway, the prosecutor, uh, the office of the prosecutor uh, um, was able, after investigations, was able to indict only 13 persons. And those 13 persons were, well, not all of them went to trial. Eventually, about 10 of them went to trial. Three, uh, for, for different reasons, were not uh, before the court. Two died before uh, their, their, their trial, and before they were even uh, brought before the court. One has been at, at large since. Pass forward, trials, and eventually we had convictions against uh, nine persons. Well, 10 went to court, but only nine persons were eventually convicted. And, and the reason is one of them died before the trial, before the end of the trial. He had been through the proceedings, but 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 sadly passed away. Now, how were the trials organized? We got we had um, three main factions that were engaged in the conflict, and the we, the prosecutor basically charged all most of the leaders, the leaders of each of those factions, and and eventually of the three that we had the three, uh, uh, the 10 that we had three, each were in the factions. The AFRC had three persons, the RUF had three, and the uh, CDF had three. But we had, uh, it was a civil conflict that had some elements of external uh, 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 intervention or interference, if you like, and this was in the uh, person of uh, Mr. Charles Taylor, former president of Liberia, who had meddled in the conflict. And many of you uh, may have obviously heard about uh, his role in the conflict. Um, Sierra Leone is rich in diamonds and the, uh, the protagonists of the war had their eyes on the diamond, on the diamond fields and every, every so often they captured these fields and uh, you know, controlled the diamond mining operations. They got the diamonds. Taylor was interested in these. 
So he facilitated there the, the fighting by uh, uh, providing them arms and ammunition in return for diamonds. So he had an abetted this, the, 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 fact, the, 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 the conflict. Eventually, uh, the close of the proceedings, the close of the trials, there were convictions and sentences. We had between um, 15 years and 52 years for those who were sentenced, uh, for those who were convicted. And, and we, uh, by uh, virtue of a, of a sentence enforcement agreement, two sentence enforcement agreements, which the court uh, entered into between, uh, with Rwanda separately and with the UK, we now have all these uh, prisoners serving their terms in, 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 in prison. Eight of them actually were sent to Rwanda and Charles Silo, as, as many of you know, is in the UK. Um, now, during the course of this conflict, uh, a lot of lives were lost. Uh, uh, we have conservative estimates that uh, largely coming from uh, the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which puts the number of deaths to about 75,000. We had probably twice that number who were maimed, who were uh, uh, injured physically and mentally, raped, and so on. And so it was uh, in volume a, a conflict of of, 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 a, of a very wide magnitude, and 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 it's affected the lives of many. Now, um, not only uh, was the special court involved in the process of uh, bringing peace and justice earlier, but we had UN intervention at the end of this conflict. Uh, which saw peacekeepers being uh, deployed in the country. We also had uh, a process for demobilizing and, and disarming uh, combatants, a DDR pro pro program, uh, which was very successful. And as well, we had um, the, uh, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. In fact, that gave a different uh, face to the, uh, um, the process of, 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 of justice, of post-conflict justice. As, as we know, um, you know, the, uh, the TRC processes are more about restorative justice, whereas uh, in the case of the special court, we're focused largely on uh, criminal accountability for crimes, which is retributive justice. So these were, um, by way of background, these are sort of the antecedents to uh, what, what we want to discuss today, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, achievements of the court in terms of largely its contribution to the jurisprudence of international criminal uh, law, justice, basically criminal law and justice. Um, of course, uh, many of you, as, as we all know now, that um, in the case of uh, the special court, Charles Stiller, uh, he pleaded um, before he at the trial, before he was even arrested, uh, he pleaded, he, he challenged the, the court's uh, jurisdiction on the basis that he, he had sovereign immunity and and the court had to, uh, the appeals chamber had to rule on this even before Charles Stiller was actually arrested uh, and brought to justice. And obviously the court ruled that um, uh, against international crimes, uh, that cannot be a defense at all. And we, uh, it is important for us uh, and for Africa generally that um, that principle was um, uh, since Nuremberg, uh, again for the first time, uh, solidly uh, uh, um, um, uh, 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 hammered on in, in, with, with, within, within international criminal justice. Now, um, we had before Charles Taylor's case, we had Milosevic uh, in the ICTY who had been uh, arrested and, and charged and who had gone to trial, but we, we know he died. And so in Charles Taylor's case, we had him uh, not only indicted while in office, he was uh, then arrested, eventually tried and convicted and sentenced and he's serving jail. So he, he is one good example of where a head of state uh, uh, is put through the entire process of justice to the end. Uh, and our contribution to that, I think we, we're very proud of. We also had uh, first in a number of uh, areas in jurisprudence, the was the first court that um, uh, 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 the rule on the uh, question of child soldiers, the recruitment uh, uh, of child soldiers, basically um, children under the age of 15. 
uh, uh, were obviously a common feature in the, in the conflict, not just children, not, not, under, not just under the age of 15, but children generally. And it's a common feature in African conflicts that um, children are made to be part of the, of the, of the war effort, either in, in, in the front lines or in other efforts that aid uh, 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 fighting. And so the special court was um, the first court that had a, a, a judge a decision which uh, uh, not, not criminalized but actually convicted persons who had participated in the act of recruiting child soldiers of, of, of uh, under the age, children under the age of 15. We also uh, had a great, uh, 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 we made a great mark on the question of peacekeepers, peacekeeping uh, forces. Uh, we um, had a situation where during the course of the conflict, peacekeepers who had, who had uh, been deployed in the country to help uh, quell the situation were uh, uh, targeted and attacked and, and killed and their uh, equipment uh, seized and, and so on. And, and, and this was really quite insulting and affront, and affront to the, the, the whole idea of, of trying to bring justice to, to a, a warring uh, uh, country. There had been obviously other cases where peacekeepers had been, uh, had been uh, uh, um, attacked, I think, in the, in the Balkans. There was a case of uh, the UNPO 4, but I, I don't know to what extent um, that was separately charged before the ICTY. But in this case, uh, the special court for Sierra Leone was the first to uh, bring a conviction and, and uh, for, this, for this act. Uh, moving further, we were able to break new ground in the area of uh, uh, sexual violence offenses. Basically, there is the, uh, uh, a new ground that was broken uh, in the area of forced marriage. Before this time, uh, there was never any crime of forced marriage. We had uh, rape generally as, a, as an offense, uh, 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 as, as an offense. We had um, sexual violence offenses as crimes against humanity, which encompass like uh, sexual slavery and, and enslavement. However, we did not have a situation which captured the phenomena where um, women were not only just enslaved, were not only just raped, but were kept in a constant kind of state of marriage, uh, quote unquote, the uh, combatants themselves actually referred to these women as their wives. They did a, a whole lot of things apart from uh, pro uh, providing con conjugal uh, services. They uh, were actually women uh, uh, in the form of marriage. One example was a case of a witness who um, who was explaining what it meant, a woman, what it meant to not uh, have a, a combatant as, the, as, 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 as a sort of protector. She said you would be like a, like, like a ball uh, in a football field, you kicked around. Uh, I mean, it was a situation forced upon them. So, you know, you had a, a situation where marriage was forced upon women. They looked, upon, they looked up to uh, it because they needed the protection. So uh, the special court for Sierra Leone was able to uh, carve out that niche as, a, a, as a, a special crime which falls under other, in, uh, other in human acts as a crime against humanity. Uh, we go on and on. Uh, important, one important other point about the achievements of the court was the, um, the work of the outreach. Outreach uh, played a very important and exceptional role, in fact, uh, uh, very much groundbreaking and which, which has been uh, followed uh, not just by uh, courts, uh, other international courts, but also by uh, other international organizations. The model of outreach which was introduced was one where we were operating a court uh, uh, in a country where the crimes were committed. And it had its advantages and disadvantages. One advantage obviously would be that you had quicker access, easier access to witnesses, to crime scenes and so on. Another uh, and a disadvantage was that, you know, acceptability, the, 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 the accused persons and their supporters were all on, on the ground and they, they, some of them completely were against the court. So it was the business of, the, of, the, uh, of this outreach unit 
uh, which, which was headed then by the current uh, 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 registrar of the court, uh, uh, Mrs. Pinta Mansouri. Uh, it was the business of this court, to, to, of these units, to, uh, to open up those channels of communication, to ensure that the court, uh, the prosecutors, the, the, even the defense uh, teams were able to reach out to witnesses and the witnesses were able to speak with the, to them without fear and weak victims in communities were able to express their views. Uh, it was a two-way thing. Um, um, during meetings with these uh, communities, the, uh, the outreach team would invite prosecuting lawyers as well as defense lawyers at uh, different times to speak and, put their, and, and, and just give a, a clear picture of what was going on and how it would help uh, to, to break uh, uh, you know, the barriers. So that was a great uh, achievement by the court. Uh, now, fast forward. Uh, I would not. I will not uh, uh, do all. I will not say all of it now. But perhaps in the Q and A, we may have an opportunity to expand on some of these. But fast forward. Now, once the court had completed its work in 2013, December 2013, it became necessary. Uh, it, it, the, the main mandate had been completed. Now, I talked about three persons who had not gone. To, who were not uh, in court. Uh, were indicted, but they were not in court. Two died, and one was at large. And that person's indictment still remains open today. Now, even though that person had not been indicted, had not been uh, brought to court, we still uh, consider that the mandate, the, main, the mandate of the of the, of the court had been uh, uh, completed successfully. Uh, and so, when it shut it, it shut down its doors in 2013, uh, the residual special courts then kicked in, kicked up. Uh, kicked off in 2014, January. So there was hardly any gap. In fact, it was more like a transition. I, I often prefer to refer to it as a transition rather than one court shutting down its doors and another court starting its operation. Uh, in any event, we have uh, since, uh, uh, how are we connected with the special court? Now, one of the things, what, what, uh, an important function that the residual court is given is to carry out the uh, functions of the special court, which remain to be uh, carried out, which did not end. Uh, meaning, for instance, that we had witnesses uh, who continue to uh, need protection and support, meaning that we have uh, the prisoners who have now been. locked in jail in Rwanda under a system of conditional early release that we practice. Uh, if they've served two thirds of their time, they have the, uh, the opportunity to apply uh, to be released early and, and, and the court created. It's a very important document, very important. Is a very important document records and important material that needs to be. So the court is there to do all of that. In addition, we also provide assistance to national prosecution authorities if they request assistance. Many people who actually uh, uh, we investigated a lot of. We had quite a lot. I'm speaking as a prosecutor now, and we had a lot. Uh, uh, that we find and who find themselves on the territory, and perhaps there is not sufficient information about their whereabouts, and they may have been in that part of the world over a period. So, so uh, we are able to provide to conduct review of uh, of uh, sentences of of conviction sentences. Obviously, the provision makes for the prosecution making that application within a year and that is passed for all of them so but for all of the convicted persons they still have the the option of uh, the, the 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 rights to come to the court anytime that uh, if they meet the criteria for making an application for review which is that a new information uh, which was not there before the court and which could have uh, uh, which which would have, we could have uh, led to a different outcome in in the in in the in the uh, decision uh, it has been found, and if they're able to uh, bring that forward, then the court is able, will be able to 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 look at the case as a, by way of review. 
I talked about Johnny Paul Kuroma, who is uh, now uh, still at large. He has some information that he is dead. The one person whose indictment is open. And the court has an, uh, uh, the option of trying him if he's found alive. That is, if no other country in the world which, with, with the capacity, the, 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 uh, the laws and, and, and what it takes. Uh, uh, Angela mentioned uh, universal jurisdiction a short while ago. If, if there is no, um, if, 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 if any country in the world hasn't the, the capacity to do so, then the special courts will try. Yeah. Uh, just uh, before, we, before I, I round up, I hope I, I'm not uh, out of time. Um, important to understand that all of these achievements uh, are happen uh, uh, um, in this, you know, in a court. It's important to understand uh, under, uh, under, you know, in a court. Now, the experience that we had in Sierra Leone uh, is an experience that is uh, in conflict situations. Why? And, and there's a lot that uh, many countries can learn from, not just uh, brought back to Sierra Leone, but also the processes that this court engaged in, 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 uh, in contributing to peace. Thank you. I, I will take questions in the q and A. I I hope I haven't overrun my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Um, now we're going to uh, shift focus a little bit from international uh, criminal justice, and we're going to consider now with our final speaker for today, uh, Dr. Mamadou Hebi, who's going to talk to us about reforming the investor state dispute settlement system in Africa. So, um, Mamadou, it's up to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to join you this evening together with my co panelists and uh, to discuss the issue of international justice in, in uh, Africa. Uh, you may have noticed that I am not really uh, at that moment working in an arbitration institution like ICSID or the PCA, and it might be a little bit uh, strange that I start talking about investment arbitration. I should perhaps rather talk about the court and uh, Africa. But I chose to focus on uh, investment arbitration because of two reasons, two main reasons. The first reason is that I didn't find anything particularly challenging in the relation between the International Court of Justice and uh, Africa. We all remember that in uh, 1966, the court rendered the Southwest Africa uh, cases decision where it decided not that it did not have jurisdiction at the merit stage to hear claims brought by Liberia and Ethiopia with respect to the racist policies in uh, southern Africa, which is nowadays Namibia. This has created a real, huge reaction from African states who were looking at the court from distance with fear, with a lack of trust and confidence. But over time, the court has been able to revert the tide and uh, to gain the confidence of uh, African countries. It has done so through decisions such as the Western Sahara Advisory Opinion, the recognition that there were certain obligations that you call erga omnes and Barcelona traction. It has changed its rules on how to deal with preliminary objection and uh, to clearly state when you move a preliminary objection to the merit stage to put it in writing and not to just invent it at a, or just to find it out at the later stage when it becomes uh, convenient. So since the 1980s, rather, the court has become really a place where African states go to in order to to have their uh, disputes settled. Burkina Faso, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Tunisia, Libya, Tunisia, Malta, Congo, Belgium, Cameroon, Nigeria, Liberia, uh, Libya, uh, United States, and uh, United Kingdom, and the list goes on. So at the moment, there are 17 cases pending before the court. And what is interesting is that there are cases involving seven African countries. So I thought that in this uh, very good relationship between the two, there is not much to say. 
But let's say that if there are some clouds that could come to the horizon, it might be with the establishment of the African Court of Justice and uh, human rights. I don't think that it will be really a big issue, uh, but this court will have jurisdiction to deal with international law matters in addition to EU law, African Union law, and human rights. So you will be in a situation where the two tribunals, the International Court of Justice and the African uh, Court of Justice and uh, Human Rights will have more or less overlapping jurisdiction about a certain number of cases. So I looked at it and I wonder whether I should really try to guess what is going to happen. And I thought that the best way to answer the question was to look at the, whether the protocol, was, uh, the protocol of Maputo was in force and how far it is. And I realized that, okay, there are seven ratification out of the 15 that are needed and it took them uh, 12 years to do so. So perhaps the next uh, uh, British Nigeria law forum meeting in, 20, in 10 or 20 years, we could have that conversation. So that was one reason why I really didn't want to talk about uh, uh, the AU. Uh, the court and the uh, and dispute settlement in Africa. It would have been too descriptive and really looking to the past. Uh, as far as uh, investment arbitration is concerned, there there are there are uh, news. There are things going on. There are uh, changes, reforms, uh, dis dissatisfaction on various uh, sides, and African countries are quite. Uh, important stakeholders, just based on the fact that we, Africa possesses quite some relevant natural resources indispensable to the global economy, and that it is in need often of uh, foreign investment. So this is an issue which in my view is quite topical for African countries, and I would like them to be better engaged in the discussions about the reform. The system which was established in the 1960s, we could say that we were not experienced, we didn't know, we didn't have the competencies, but now what there is, if they establish a new system for 50 years, it will be very difficult to argue ignorance, lack of competence, or just uh, that we were sleeping. So that's, uh, that's one thing. And what I noticed is that, yes, ICSID, if you look at ICSID, ICSID has been trying to update its rules. Actually, just in May, uh, it published uh, together uh, with the UNCITRAL uh, Code of Conduct for Arbitrators in Investment uh, Arbitration. You have the Working Group 3 of UNCITRAL, the UN Commission of International Trade, uh, which is also going on. And they are uh, uh, discussing reforms to the investment uh, dispute settlement uh, mechanism. I looked at the discussions, I looked at what was being uh, put on the table and considered, and I realized that the reforms that are proposed are more incremental, trying to make a few tweaks to the system in order to make it stand, but that they are not uh, as such fundamental, they are not as such systemic, they, it is not a uh, real questioning about the legitimacy and current functioning of the system and whether there are real alternatives that should be put on the table. Uh, now, what are the issues that are being considered? They are trying to avoid the uh, conflicting and inconsistent decisions between arbitral tribunal. They are trying to hold arbitrators to higher standards of uh, uh, ethics and deontology. They are trying to make sure that the procedures are less costly and affordable. They are trying to establish and uh, establish a multilateral uh, international court to deal with investment uh, arbitration, especially an appeal score. So they are trying to regulate a little bit the procedure, but this is just uh, trying really to, you are remaining within the current framework and trying to make it uh, work. And I wonder whether this is really where we want to go, especially when one considers the serious criticism that are being thrown at uh, the current investment uh, investor state 
arbitration uh, dispute settlement mechanism. And what is even more interesting is that the criticism are no longer coming from uh, scholars who are easily tainted as a communist, leftist, uh, or radical left. I would always laugh when I hear that. Uh, they are no longer coming from African countries or Asians or, uh, or uh, Latin Americans. The criticism against the system are coming from Europe, from Germany, from uh, uh, the European Court of Justice, ACLIA. You have all this reluctance of having instead, uh, to have inter investor state dispute settlement mechanism as it is, at least when it applies to uh, European state, even the United States is looking at investor state uh, dispute settlement mechanism with a certain caution. So I don't, at the moment when I looked at it, what are the proposals that African countries have made? African countries have not made really much proposal. I listed the, who, what they have sent. And what I notice is that Morocco has made a, two proposals. South Africa, Mali, the Republic of Guinea has sent a report of a colloquium that they had held on the, uh, on the ancestral uh, reform discussions. And what is very interesting is that the participant at the conclusion of the report, they say, the participant found that the meeting was very, very useful because it allowed them to uh, uh, stay abreast the current discussion. And I'm like, no, that's not what you want. You don't want just to be updated on the discussion. You want to be able to participate in the discussion. This, control, this is completely different from the approach of the European uh, Union. The European Council has given mandate to the Council to promote the establishment of a multilateral investment court because they believe that a court would be better than uh, arbitrators and to think about this possibility of appeals. So what is being proposed by the European Union and advocated by the European Union is to put another layer on top of the current system of investment arbitration. So that if you are unhappy about your decision, you think that it's wrong as a matter of law or as a matter of fact, you can appeal it before a court. I personally think that instead of putting another layer at the international level, perhaps we have to put another layer at the domestic level. And that layer at the domestic level is the uh, the requirement for the exertion of local remedies. So let me define what I mean by the requirement of exertion for the exertion of local remedies. This requirement is quite common in the field of diplomatic protection, in the field of human rights law, and it stands for the proposition that before being entitled to bring a claim at the international level, you try first to settle, uh, to find a remedy before the domestic courts and tribunals of the state concern. Does it mean that you have to pursue domestic remedies when there are none? Obviously, no. When there are no domestic remedies, there is no rule for the exertion of local remedies. It doesn't also mean that when the local remedies are futile, that you have to pursue them. You may not, but you can go directly at the international level. But when there are domestic remedies that are capable of uh, giving you justice, delivering justice, the exhaustion of local remedies rule would require that you, uh, you exhaust them first before bringing the matter uh, at the international uh, level. And why do I believe that African countries should advocate for it and push for it strongly in the current uh, negotiations? First, because it allows the exhaustion of local remedies uh, allows them to first provide justice to the foreign investor. It gives them the opportunity to remedy their wrong. When you are in a situation where the rule of law is not well established, it is very, very easy. And even in the most well established uh, uh, trained legal system, it is always possible that a lower court 
will make a very bad interpretation of the law. It is always possible that a local officer will just infringe your rights and it happens. These are a real fact of life. I don't know any country where you can say that these kind of uh, issues do not arise. And you are able to get justice if you take the matter to a higher court or if you take the matter to a higher administrative review of the decision that has been, uh, that has been uh, rendered. So I mean that the failure to deliver justice is not due to malice. It is not due only to, it might be due to ignorance, it might be due to incompetence of the first person you had to deal with, but going at the international level, before going at the international level, you give the state the opportunity to make right its wrong. The second reason why I believe that, um, that I believe that uh, the exertion of local remedies rule uh, should be advocated for is because the premise that underlines its marginalization in investment arbitration is flawed, just as a matter of legal, of logic, basically, not even legal thinking just as a matter of, uh, of logic. I should say that the current system doesn't exclude. I use the term marginalize. I, it doesn't prohibit. The current system does not prohibit inserting the exertion of local remedies in uh, bilateral investment treaties, in domestic law relating to uh, investment arbitration. To the contrary, Article 26 exit allows it, but you have to opt it in. You have to choose it. It's not the default mechanism uh, of the system. But when this was being adopted, the idea that a foreign investor could take a case directly at the international level, which is known as arbitration without privity, without requiring a special agreement with the state, was not, in, was not contemplated. It was contemplated in APL versus Sri Lanka, but that was already in the 90s. The system was based, was created when people were thinking that there would always be a need for, a special, for their special consent. They did not foresee the fact that their consent would be considered as given in the domestic law or uh, automatically in the, uh, in, the, in the BIT. And then the exhaustion of local remedies uh, the, the current system, rather, not the exertion of local remedies, the current system was established when it was quite okay to look at certain judicial system and consider them that this one are really backward, you know, they are really not good. Actually, during colonial period, capitulations were exactly based on that idea. The judicial system of a certain number of countries were considered to be not at the standard of the European judicial system and therefore required a capitulation system in order to be able to give justice to the European countries. In the 1960s, it was quite easy to look at uh, uh, the judicial system of Burkina Faso and easily dismiss it and say, no, these people, this, they cannot deliver justice uh, to our foreign investor. We have to give, find a special system for those uh, investors. But nowadays, when you say that, I believe that it looks shocking. I believe, I hope it looks shocking, or I hope it looks shocking. So, and we have realized time and time again that the best domestic legal system can get it wrong, and the worst domestic legal system can get it right in a specific case. The presumption is not uh, uh, waterproof. It's not waterproof. You cannot decide that the judicial system, presume that the judicial system of uh, three quarter of the legal orders is not good and decide that for them, okay, uh, we should presume that uh, the domestic system is not good and for them, we don't need to exhaust local remedies because they will be pointless uh, uh, anyhow. Recently in the discussions, you will read uh, that some people will say yes, because Europeans are uh, challenging the investor state arbitration system. What we have to do is to exclude it for inter-European arbitration cases 
but we can still use it for the like of Burkina Faso, Mali, Senegal, and uh, others. And this rings like the 19th century, where you had an international law for uh, a European international law system and an international law for the rest of us who allowed colonization, slavery, and etc. So I don't think that this is really the idea where we want to go. If we want to go somewhere, we have to think about the principle of equal sovereignty of our states, of the judicial system, and the same presumption should uh, apply. Thirdly, don't get me wrong, I am not in favor of uh, injustice. I'm not in favor of depriving investors of their right. I love human right and I did a master in it. So I really love what I do, what uh, this is about. But even in this system that I'm proposing, exhausting local remedies, foreign investors will gain justice. They will gain justice either first at the domestic level or at the international level. People will ask me, but Mamadou, what about the delay, the delay in procedures? What about the delay in procedure? We are lawyers, we know how to compensate time. We know how to compensate time. We know how to, to take that into account. And what about if the, there is compensation is, is given at the domestic level, but it is not deemed enough by the foreign investor? Then you can take a dispute at the international level, which would be limited to the amount of the compensation because the, it has already been established at the domestic level that your rights have been breached. So you will always, uh, a foreign investor will always be able to gain, uh, uh, to, to have access to justice and to have its right vindicated. I will just ask for two or three minutes in order to, to conclude. I don't want to be uh, overly, overly long. So let's look at, uh, now, does it align to, does the exhaustion of local remedies rule align with the natural inclination of African states when you look at their practice? Except for their BITs, when you look at it for all interstate uh, arbitration, uh, inter individual state litigation at the international level, African countries tend to require the exhaustion of local remedies. The only one who do not are the West African in the context of the ECOWAS Court of Justice, but this is due to specific uh, uh, reasons. Even in the Pan-African Investment Code, they included the idea that the local remedies uh, should be exhausted. Finally, let's think about the exhaustion of local remedies from a state of the rule, from a perspective of the rule of law. I believe that if this rule is implemented, state will learn. The first time that they go to invest, uh, investment arbitration and they have to pay huge uh, damages, they will learn. They will adjust the system. And this will ripple down to the rest of the judicial system. We will be contributing to the UN development goal using it actually investor state dispute settlement as a framework. But now outsourcing, taking, removing investor state dispute settlement from the domestic litigation actually makes the system poor. I try to look at how much does the average exceed procedure cost. It's around 900,000 US dollar. 900,000 US dollar. I am from Burkina Faso. And I asked a friend to check with our Ministry of, Defense, of Justice how much is the entire Burkina Faso justice uh, budget. It is four times the average cost of an investor state dispute settlement, uh, an investor state uh, dispute proceedings. It's, four, one, it's just four times that. It means that if Burkina Faso has four investment cases against it, we have to take the budget of our entire country in order to provide justice to four investors. This is just, in my view, something that cannot be uh, accepted. I have advocated, I've done my, my part. That was, that's what I was up to. Uh, you might ask, 
but would African countries be credible when they try to advocate for, uh, for the exhaustion of local remedies rule? This I would like to take it up during the conversation, otherwise that might be too long. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, very compelling. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I want to ask some quick follow-up questions, which, which, which I have. Uh, so please try and be quite brief in your response if you can. Uh, the first question is to um, Dahiru. Um, in your role as an international cooperation advisor, what are some of the challenges, the cooperation challenges that you have encountered in relation to investigations in Africa? Well, I believe there are a number of challenges which uh, the court uh, has been facing over the past year and which I happen to experience in my uh, own work. As an international cooperation uh, advisor, my role is actually to open the doors for our investigators to be able to actually uh, uh, go into uh, on the territory of country and collect evidence and, and therefore negotiate uh, agree agreement per se. Uh, but I could see that uh, uh, in, in my dealings with some states and the work we do, uh, from my experience, I think that uh, cooperation is, isn't necessarily always forthcoming. You, you have to, to do more to actually, and especially because under the Rome Statute, uh, there is a general obligation uh, uh, from state party to cooperate, but there is no particular mechanism to actually compel them to, to cooperate with the ICC, as we know, uh, we uh, international uh, uh, law is made of sovereign states, and therefore uh, the ICC doesn't doesn't escape that, that system. And, and often, uh, when we do have cooperation requests, and we trying to actually secure uh, the execution of that request, um, and, and particularly in many African countries, we 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 facing delay, which impacts also on, on the 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 proceedings. So it, of, often people say yes. The proceeding at the ICC takes so long. There are many reasons. Investigations are not that easy, especially if you have to have investigators traveling to particular countries where they have to meet victims, witnesses who don't speak their language. You need interpreters to get information. Uh, you have to uh, ensure that you have the uh, evidence that meet the necessary uh, threshold for to be admitted before the ICC. And and often personally, what I see is uh, it's very difficult for me to somehow determine whether. Uh, it's an issue of bureaucracy, uh, uh, which, um, is, uh, which explains the delay in executing cooperation requests, or whether it's a uh, disguised uh, non-cooperation issue. And, and often, I, I can tell you that uh, in my experience, I have had to follow up on one particular request, for example, for over two years before uh, uh, getting it executed. So uh, beyond that, uh, broadly, we have uh, issues relating to uh, agreement, especially in Africa, on regional protection, obviously, because the systems are, are not the same. I think we have a great system in South Africa, and Angela probably knows a lot about that. But uh, one key challenge the court is facing uh, today is also the fact that there is no much cooperation from state to arrest the fugitives. We, we do have one uh, surrender a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, in the Darfur situation. It's uh, um, uh, Ali shape, but we do have uh, still 13 fugitives at large, uh, 13 suspects at large, which haven't been arrested. And the court continues, and we continue our way to actually, uh, with the support of other states, of the civil society organization, to make sure that uh, cooperation comes. But it's a very a long exercise and, and, and it's quite uh, something we have to continue to pursue. Thank you. Um, a question for Angela now. Uh, you've mentioned in your presentation regional courts. As you know, we have the Malabo Protocol. So what are your thoughts on an African court with criminal jurisdiction as proposed by the uh, protocol? Thanks. I think it would be a very good thing to have a, a regional court. However, the current proposal I think is inadequate, particularly because of Article 46 ABIS, which gives immunity to senior government officials. Now, what is the definition of a senior government official? 
I don't know, you tell me. So the idea that there's this layer of individuals who are immune from prosecution whilst in office, I think is unacceptable. I don't think that victims should have to wait until someone leaves office before he or she is prosecuted. I mean, we saw with the Hussein Habre trial that it took 25 years before he was brought to justice. And in the meantime, victims die, witnesses die, testimony degrades in terms of what you remember. Evidence is just harder to, to come by and harder to present. So it, this is not good for the victims if people have to wait for that long for justice. And I think for as long as the Malabo protocol stays as it is, then I'm not sure that this is the regional court that we want. Also, there's several questions with regard to financing. How is the African Union going to pay for this court? I mean, the Hussein Harbour trial alone, I believe, cost 9.7 million, and that was one person. So where is the African Union going to get this money from? And also, there's just been no rush from African states to, to sign or ratify this. I believe it has 15 signatures to date, but no ratifications. It needs 15 ratifications to come into force. So there's several questions as to how this will even take shape and where we will begin. But I think for as long as it's fundamentally flawed, particularly with regard to the immunity question, we need to do better and come up with something that will work. Thank you. Uh, question for Mohammed. Uh, how would you rate the contribution of the RSCSL towards achieving peace in Sierra Leone? Thank you. Um, the RSCSL uh, made tremendous contribution to achieving peace in Sierra Leone. And before I get into any detail as to the nature of that contribution, let me just say that um, at the end of the country, at the end of the trial, Um, the special project, an uh, independent uh, international justice organization, ICTJ, and they uh, came up with uh, the question of this is so deep on the Hello? and question on the question of how much uh, contribution had the special court made towards peace in Sierra Leone. They came up with um, something like 93% of Sierra Leoneans agreeing that the special court had contributed. Uh, to bringing peace to Sierra Leone. And in Liberia, I think something in the region of 75% agreed that the special court's work in Sierra Leone had impacted peace in Liberia as well. So um, just on the, on the, in the area of statistics, but um, if you come down to the question of peace versus justice, Um, and, and, you know, uh, position, uh, position society, post-conflict societies largely be able to address the questions of justice in a post-conflict situation. Now, it may be not necessarily a court uh, uh, that, 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 that brings uh, persons responsible for the crimes uh, as we have in, in an accountability process. It may be like a TRC process. It may be some other process anyway, but there has to be some mechanism, some process which brings uh, justice. And to that extent, the Special Court for Sierra Leone contributed quite immensely. It's been appreciated. Uh, and what, what it does is, if, you, if you're not able to address the question of justice, you, you find out that societies are hardly able to move forward. They are hardly able to uh, move on to uh, 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 post-conflict or post-conflict, uh, 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 post uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, progress, if you like. Questions of rebuilding, questions of, uh, of rebuilding the infrastructure and not necessarily just physical infrastructure, talking of rebuilding uh, the systems, the, for instance, the legal, the legal uh, uh, system, the justice system, I mean, the institutions. These are all uh, uh, issues, uh, areas that, that require work to be done in a post-conflict situation. And ultimately, eventually, the question of building the economy and moving forward. Now, if you haven't got it right in terms of bringing justice at the beginning, you're not likely to get it right down the road. Well, in the case of Sierra Leone, I would say that it is
still, uh, to some extent, a work uh, tremendous. It was uh, a work in progress. But this, it was uh, overwhelming, and that had helped. Uh, that has helped in in the building process in many ways. The UN, over the UN, has been building uh, a, a, a program in Sierra Leone, even a peace building uh, program, and so on. So it is. It, is, it was the special process of venture has been great, tremendous. Thank you. Okay, and um, a question now for um, Mamadou. Let me just bring it up. One second. So Mamadou, um, would you say that regional investment courts would be a better solution than a full return to the exhaustion of local remedies requirement? Are you there, Mamadou? I am here now. <laughs> yes, forgot to turn it on. Uh, it's fine. The regional uh, courts, that's also another alternative. It's uh, being thrown up. You have the uh, ECOWAS investment protocol, which is foreseeing actually investment arbitration within ECOWAS. But the first question that you might have is how would these regional investment court have jurisdiction again on other foreign investor because the BIT does not involve their state. That could be uh, one difficulty. Uh, the second difficulty that I see is, again, justice has to be close to the people. And the closest to the people is rather the domestic legal system. It's not the regional or it's not the universal system. It is the closest, the closer it is, uh, the better it is. But I would agree that I would think that that at the regional list is better than the system that we have, far better, I have to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me ask a question to everybody here from what the audience has asked so far. Uh, how likely is it that a future African criminal court will cooperate with the ICC? So maybe we'll begin with Dahiru and uh, the rest of you can chime in, possibly. I think I started to do like Mehmet was. Uh, um, it's it's difficult to say. Uh, I think, um, as you know, the Malabo Protocol doesn't actually make any reference to the ICC per se, and gives no clarification as to how the two courts may may work together. Uh, I know for sure that the complementarity from the uh, African court would be vis-a-vis -vis, um, national uh, court and the regional court if it's provided uh, for. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it welcomes assistance from other courts. And I guess also it may be an assistance from the ICC. Uh, but I, I believe that uh, it's going to be a bit tricky probably for states uh, who are at the same time parties to the ICC statute and, and uh, parties to the Malabo protocol in particular, if uh, we were to uh, investigate the same situations uh, to have to send cooperation requests that are competing requests. Obviously, the Rome Statute provides for an avenue. It means we will have to consult. The, uh, um, actually, the uh, state has to consider that uh, ICC would have some priority vis a -vis or other, other entities, but uh, uh, it, it's a bit difficult. Uh, it's still uh, something we need to, to, uh, to wait and see. What I can say is that uh, you, if things gets very well, and I'm an advocate for uh, African justice for African people. Uh, uh, don't get me wrong, the fact that I work at the ICC doesn't mean that, uh, just as Mamadou said, uh, it's good to have justice close to the people. And I think that uh, uh, the ICC, as we always say, is, is not uh, uh, the prime, it doesn't have a prime, it's a last court, uh, uh, a last resort court. And as such, I think that uh, um, we can, if things go well, find ways of cooperating ICC and, and the African courts when it becomes a reality. Uh, 
Uh, we are doing that with, uh, for example, the Special Court from uh, Central African Republic today, uh, exchanging on best practices, uh, building capacities, and you may have that situations in the context of, of uh, uh, a relationship, uh, potential assistance or cooperation between the ICC and, and the African Court. Um, it remains to see, considering the number of crimes the African Court uh, uh, has given itself, uh, 14 uh, in comparison to ICC, uh, where, where things, which direction things will take. But obviously, if it's about the tree, because there's no aggression uh, in the Malabo Protocol, uh, uh, per se, it's more about genocide and crime against humanity and war crimes. There may be room for cooperation in the future, but it's still premature to, to say. Uh, Angela, what's your take? Yeah, I agree with everything that he said. I would just add that also I think there's an added dimension of complexity because the Rome Statute is complementary to domestic systems and there's no provision made specifically for a regional court in, in the Rome Statute. So even though, as he's already mentioned, there are ways around that, but I think that would be a fundamental place to start in terms of trying to clarify the relationship between these entities should a court of this nature come into existence. And just to add, I think he's also made a good point that the proposed African court would have jurisdiction over 14 crimes, which are everything from corruption to mercenarism to unconstitutional change of government. And perhaps their efforts would be better focused there and let the ICC deal with genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity, just as an example. And also with this article 46A, this, if senior government officials are immune from prosecution before the African court, they will end up in front of the ICC. And I think this was an unintended consequence of just political wrangling when it came to developing the Malabo Protocol. But that is something that, as you said, we'd have to watch and see. It is, it's very premature to say, but these are some of the things we can sort of project when we look at the situation. Okay. Um, Mohammed, what say you? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think it's all been said. Um, there's obviously um, a lot uh, that uh, needs to be clarified in terms of how that relationship pans out. And um, more especially the fact that, um, uh, you know, you have crimes uh, there, uh, uh, sorry, the principle of, 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 of immunity for crimes by uh, senior state officials is not one that the ICC, that, that works within the ICC as, as own system. So basically um, um, there is quite a lot that, that, that uh, requires clarification. And the, also the question of, you know, just having competing, competing uh, jurisdictions within a particular situation is, is one that is, uh, you know, at this stage uh, sounds, would look bewildering. I think what is more important ultimately, uh, what, what all of this, uh, uh, you know, begs is the idea, the fact that we have to build uh, domestic systems and avoid these kind of situations. I mean, obviously these are courts that are established to be courts of last resort if uh, justice can be done efficiently and effectively uh, at home, there would not be a reason to have, uh, you know, a scenario where there is competition as to who exercises jurisdiction over a particular situation that is in a domestic setting. Um, so yes, I, I, I support, I agree with uh, what has been said by the others, thank you. And Mama, do anything different to add? Uh, may I ask a question then? <laughs> because I think that my colleagues have already said everything that uh, has to be said on this issue. I have a question with regard to the universal character of the crimes that are prosecuted by the ICC and uh, the complementarity principle. I think that there is a contradiction between the two. If you consider that the ICC uh, is prosecuting the most the gravest crimes in international law, then its competence should be based on the gravity of the crime. Not its jurisdiction should be based on the gravity of the crime, not on the ability of some actors to deliver justice or not to deliver it at their domestic level. Because as soon as you introduce this, you focus the jurisdiction of the uh, ICC over a certain number of countries that are, it's inherent in the system. It's inherent to the, in the system. It is a problem that I see. I think that the, gravi the, the, the fact that the crimes are the gravest should mean that the jurisdiction of the 
ICC should be based on gravity and not on the domestic ability to deliver the crime. Otherwise, you will always have this criticism that uh, African countries are targeted, perhaps Asian countries one day, or uh, Arab countries, because you will never be looking at uh, where the rest, some of us are uh, looking. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Well, if I may, um, yeah, I, th yeah, I think we... Um, I understand uh, the point you you were making, Mamadou. It's um, uh, the, the the whole issue isn't per se um, the fact. The fact is the following: the gravity is one element that we consider. Obviously, uh, this is, and we're not going after all the crimes uh, which uh, uh, do not actually uh, um, are not seen as. Uh, uh, hurting the conscience of humanity. We, we're focusing on those crimes. But I think the premise of the discussion should be, uh, initially, was there any ICC there? Uh, and there wasn't ICC. And the key issue, because there was no ICC, often, when you have crimes of such nature occurring in countries, uh, and because most uh, uh, of the time, it's about the leaders, uh, either the head of state, the military, uh, the minister, etc. It has always been difficult for national jurisdiction in certain states to act upon that and to prosecute those persons because they are the one who hold power. And ICC has been seen as a solution to that, uh, but it, had, it didn't remove the uh, primary role that states ha still have to play. When we're looking at the gravity and what uh, uh, we do at the OTP is that we may find that there is, uh, we, we may, have considered the criteria of gravity and it has been met. But we don't always go also after the one who is at the highest. There may be someone who uh, has at the middle level, but who is so notorious because of the crimes he has committed. Uh, he has been the one on the ground. Those person you may be uh, uh, looking into based on the uh, evidence you, collect, you collected. But I think that uh, we, and I believe that in your question, there was something like uh, selective justice behind because we go somewhere, we don't look. Actually, you, you would have to go by the criteria that are there. We are not in Syria, obviously, because Syria is not a state party. Uh, uh, there have been many things happening in my own country, Togo. Uh, Togo is not a state party. I would have probably loved that there is something being done there. And I've seen the process nationally. I think uh, the ICC is a solution uh, where there is no accountability at a national level. It's not there to replace. And the gravity is an element that we consider in addition to, as I explained in my presentation earlier, other elements. Uh, obviously, we can be everywhere. ICC cannot be solving all the problems, even if you consider the gravity alone and, and, and look at what is happening all over the world. We can be everywhere. And that is where, when you have a national judicial system which are well, uh, working well, you would expect that they would take the necessary measure to do that and look into the gravity as well. So we do a complementary uh, work instead. And, and I think that we can talk about selectivity in a way you have to go, but selectivity won't happen because it's a particular country. Selectivity happens on the basis of the incidents you have, on the basis of, of uh, what has been, what was the, the crime committed in that particular uh, uh, area and what is the impact, what, what is the number of victims, etc. So that is the way we process it. Let me ask a question now to, um, let's see, Angela. Um, this is a question from the audience. It says that on the challenge of inadequate legislation under domestic justice, what do you think are some of the ways that state can be assisted in domestication, I suppose that means to, to domestic uh, prosecution, etc. And do you think that the EAU, African Union, and regional blocs can play any role in this? If I understand the question correctly, we're talking about domestication of the Rome Statute. There's many, many toolkits for this. There are toolkits that have been devised by NGOs and other think tanks about how you can domesticate the Rome Statute within your legal framework, particularly if you belong to the Commonwealth, for example, the Commonwealth has developed a toolkit to this effect. So there are things that exist out there where people have done it before and have sort of boiled it down to a format or a template that can be applicable to other situations. At this point, I don't particularly think the AU would be interested in promoting universal ratification of the Rome Statute. I think as 
has already been mentioned, the African bloc is the biggest block of signatories to the Rome Statute. And so given the tension that exists between the AU and the ICC, I'm not sure that they would find it to be in their political interest to encourage their member states to ratify when they haven't already done so. In fact, they're doing the opposite. They've been encouraging them to pull out of the Rome Statute. As we saw in, in South Africa after the Bashir case, the South African government tried to pull out of the Rome Statute system and we had to take them to court because they hadn't done it in terms of the constitutional framework. So they're at odds as far as the promotion of the Rome Statute in both its ratification and its domestication. Okay, thank you. Question for Mohammed. Um, this question asks for you to comment on why the SCSL did not formally investigate or indict Nigerian military leaders for their involvement in atrocities in um, Sierra Leone. And since the SCSL did not act, can the residual mechanism of the SCSL now uh, forward this information collected by the ICC to begin an inquiry? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, the why did the uh, SCSL not act? Uh, the SCSL is a creature of statute. The court statute itself makes provision for, um, I think it's Article 1 2, uh, makes, uh, speaks extensively about the status of uh, um, forces that were uh, engaged in peacekeeping in Sierra Leone, whether by an agreement with the UN or whether by a, a bilateral agreement as to what, 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 the, uh, uh, what the process would be vis-a-vis -vis the court's work. And, and what it said was that um, these, these uh, if there were crimes committed, these forces were supposed to not be uh, directly uh, 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 dealt with by the court, but the, the sending state would have jurisdiction, would have the, 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 the authority to punish the, the troops, uh, pretty much like uh, you know, uh, the US uh, is, 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 is happening about uh, within the, the uh, you know, against the ICC. They have the capacity to punish their own troops and they would do it. So basically, that's the thing. The sending states are allowed to, are giving the authority the mandate to punish, uh, to, to, to address crimes that were committed. If uh, they failed to do that, and, uh, or the, the, the gen if, if they failed to do that, then um, it, it would be for any uh, state in, in, in the world. to raise this uh, matter up with the UN and, and, and basically uh, and see if this is something that they can handle. So it is not uh, primarily jurisdiction that was given to the court, which the court did not handle. The court uh, would have only come in in the event that the, um, uh, uh, the sending states did not handle the case uh, of, uh, of a crime committed. And the UN General Assembly generally agreed that um, you know, uh, so, uh, the court would then, uh, should then take on the case uh, of, of an alleged crime. So that's the situation up until the close, closure of the court. Um, I cannot speak to whether uh, or, or why we, we did not uh, further uh, our efforts in that direction in pushing the Nigerian authorities. Well, I don't uh, sorry, I mentioned Nigeria here because uh, Nigeria was the principal troop contributing country to, uh, the, uh, uh, to, to bringing peace in Sierra Leone. And the allegations are there widely that it was uh, Nigerian troops actually committed crimes. So um, you know, I cannot speak to, you know, why, uh, if at all, uh, any efforts were made to pushing the Nigerians to the Nigerian government at the time to actually look at the crimes that were alleged by their troops in, in Sierra Leone. And, and so obviously it's a, it was a, it's supposed to be a two-stage kind of process, three stages in fact. First, let this troops uh, sending country deal with it, if not, uh, any state in the world can raise it up with the UN, and then the UN then can give a mandate to the court to try uh, 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 those persons alleged. Now, as to whether the, SCA, the RSCSL, that's the residual mechanism, can do that today, um, on the face of the mandate that we have, uh, I would say no, quite uh, clearly. Uh, the mandate that we have, even though it says to prosecute those who same mandate as the special court, those who bear the greatest responsibility for the crimes that were committed. Uh, but this uh, residual court's mandate is limited to very specific functions. And those functions do not include uh, opening up any new investigations 
or opening up any new cases. The only one case of persecution that is still uh, still exists within the uh, uh, scope of the RSCSL's uh, functions currently is that of the outstanding indictment of Johnny Paul Kuroma. And it was in fact, uh, for the reason that he was charged under that old mandate, under the uh, mandate of uh, to prosecute those who bear the greatest responsibility. That's one of the reasons why that same, the same wording in terms of its principal mandate is repeated in the statute of the RACSL. So I would say that no, the RACSL does not, unless, uh, again, this is a court created by two parties, UN and Sierra Leone, unless they agree someday to give jurisdiction to the court by a new process. Uh, but otherwise, no, uh, not as we as it is as the SESL is currently uh, con con constituted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll say this also that um, some questions asked by the panelists have actually been answered in written form. So all you need to do is click on the Q and A option, and you can read the answers to some of the questions posed there. And now let me ask the final question to everybody. Really. Um, this question to paraphrase asks, how can national, regional, and inst international um, tribunals and courts uh, work together and really complement each other without uh, being in competition or being threatened by each other? Uh, perhaps I'll start with uh, Mamadou to maybe talk a bit more about investor state and then we can transition to more um, international criminal justice or so what your thoughts are. So let's hear your thoughts, please. How can they strengthen each other instead of being in competition? I think that what matters really is to be able first to agree on the principle. And I believe that the principle is that justice should be done. That's really the first step. Justice should be done. So whatever system you come up with should lead to the fact that justice is delivered. Now, when you agree on that, now comes the modalities of the system. I really don't understand why Burkina Faso will spend one fourth of its uh, national budget to defend one investor state case. That's really for me something just unconscionable. It's something I cannot think of. Uh, I don't understand that uh, African countries will need to travel to Paris, London, New York, just to defend one single case. That concern their population because it involves water, it involves uh, uh, health consideration, it involves the environment, and they, the population is even not aware of the procedure that is happening. They might hear 10 years later about the huge uh, damages that the country has, has had uh, to be paid. So what I believe is uh, important is really to find the right balance. And really, really just to focus on one, key, one question, how do we get justice done? How do we get justice done starting from the domestic level to the international? The international should be only uh, complementary, but it shouldn't be uh, just the way for you to get uh, high damages. Uh, yes, so something like that. Okay, uh, same question to Angela. I think it can definitely work and I agree with what's been said about agreeing on the principles but also then you need for example at the domestic level you need to allow your citizens access to say there was a regional court to the regional court right now there are certain countries that don't have access to their sub-regional courts because they're, they're not allowed as individuals they cannot go as individuals before these courts and I think that needs to change and that needs the domestic government to make that change so allow that access understanding that when I've exhausted my domestic remedies I can elevate it to the next level and further than that, then it's what we've already talked about, complementarity. The regimes must recognize each other and make space for each other. And I'll leave it there because I feel like I've been talking more than other people have, so. Uh, Dahiru? Well, uh, I, do, I do agree with uh, what the uh, two previous speakers said. And I think that uh, there is always uh, room to work together. And uh, in context of the ICC, for example, that's what we've been doing. Uh, uh, when we, we talk about complementarity, uh, it also gives the opportunity to the uh, individual state to, to see how it can solve the problem. That is what is being uh, uh, happening in, uh, say, Guinea now. Uh, Guinea issue uh, arose back uh, in 2009, 
but they have been making effort with the support of uh, different stakeholders to try to actually bring justice uh, 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 to the victims there. Uh, we have done the same in Colombia, and Colombia have found also their way to solve it without the issue being brought before the ICC. So I think that uh, as far as the Rome Statute is, is concerned, for example, there is their provisions to ensure that uh, both the court and national uh, jurisdiction work together hand in hand to make sure that justice is brought to the victims. And as I to say, I can't agree more, justice should be, to the victims should be at the core of all the dealings between uh, uh, and the international court and the national uh, jurisdiction. Thank you. And finally, Mohammed. Yes. Um, yeah, I think uh, Mamadou nailed it uh, as to the question of what the primary focus is which is to bring justice. And my concern would be, um, you know, what, uh, what, would be, what, would, what would be the effect of not having uh, 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 these courts working together? It would be obviously that there, is, uh, uh, there would be a reign of impunity. There would be gaps, there would be situations where, uh, you know, from the criminal justice point of view, there would be situations where obviously uh, perpetrators of crimes like to uh, uh, you know, able to escape through uh, you know loopholes in the in the in, in the justice delivery system. So it is important, obviously, and I think it is obviously um, uh, 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 there is a possibility, a great scope for cooperation between between international courts. Obviously, that has been happening in in some ways, um, but also um, obviously on the basis of complementarity between international and the domestic ones. But more, more it is important that that, that kind of uh, uh, cooperation, that kind of uh, 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 synergy is there. Otherwise, as I said again, I mean, we will be faced with uh, gaps in the system and there would be a lot of uh, questions about whether we're addressing impunity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to say a huge thank you to all the speakers for the wonderful presentations. Very insightful indeed. And obviously, thank you, the attendees, for sending in your very wonderful questions indeed. Uh, what I'm going to do now whilst we round up is I'm going to tell you the results of the poll that we've had. So we had four questions and the, uh, the first question was, uh, do you feel that the ICC disproportionately targets African jurisdictions? And 44% of people here thought yes, 23% uh, thought no, and 36% uh, turns out uh, said it's hard to say. So, Dahiru, did you win the argument? I, I, we don't know. <laughs> um, the next question was, should crimes occurring in or affecting Africa be tried in Africa? And 79% uh, of people said yes, and 23% of people said no. So, Angela must be very happy with that result there. And um, thirdly, uh, in your opinion, which is the best mechanism to ensure justice and accountability for the highest offices? Uh, the options were an African criminal court, national jurisdictions, or special tribunals. And 40% of people thought an African criminal court, 16% uh, of people thought national jurisdictions, and 53% of people thought special tribunals. So on that note, I think uh, Mohammed must be very happy indeed. And the final question is, should the investor state dispute settlement system in Africa be reformed? And 96% uh, of people thought yes, and 6% uh, of people thought no. I'm not quite sure how they add up myself, but it turns out that Mamadou, you did win that debate. So uh, congratulations. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, as mentioned before, this uh, will be available on the website if you wish to view it again. Uh, please tweet about us. We are hashtag BNLF and also hashtag BNLF JLD. And that is it from us today. I'd like to thank you once again, and I wish you a very good evening. Thank you, and do take care. I am thank Tim Sassay. Cheers. Thank you so much. No worries at all. Bye-bye. Right. And thank you, colleagues. Thank right. you.